This course is designed to trigger critical thinking. And one of the articles that we'll read after about a month, oh no, not a month in this class, after about a week is, um, is about the founding fathers and how, how much it mattered to them that the voters were educated so they could, uh, they would not be manipulated by political rhetoric because they had just come from Europe and they had wanted to set up a constitutional government and the governments they came from had a king and an aristocracy and they were always um, uh, spouting rhetoric about how uh, God tells them what to do, divine right of kings. And they were uh, presented as wiser than everybody else. And our founders knew that, you know, it's not true. <laughs> it was the rule of an aristocracy and they wanted to have equal, uh, more opportunity, right? I mean, America was trying to be open to um, religious groups that were persecuted in Europe, giving people, you know, more freedom, obviously. So, so the point here is that they set up these institutions, small liberal arts colleges, and Lyon College is, is patterned after the kind of institution that our founders and long after the founders went out to the frontier to establish these institutions so that citizens and especially the educated citizens, the citizens that did have college education, they would be the future leaders and they would think critically and especially they would unite faith with reason. So they would not split reason and faith. So that was, they thought you can't have a democracy unless you unify reason and faith. You have to have reasons for why you think, you know, this is God's will or it's not. Plus they had, um, they wanted you to separate your deliberation as a citizen from your beliefs as a religious person. And John Locke, who was the grandfather of the US, wrote a whole book. I mean, it's called Letter Concerning Toleration. And it's incredibly boring to read <laughs> because he makes all these distinctions that people were thinking about at his time about the relationship between reason and faith. And his goal is to take every single way people unite them and argue against it. So it is an argument for religious toleration over, you know, when you're acting as a citizen, you don't tell people they're going to hell. You just tell them uh, in, a, in a society, you can't murder somebody, right? You decide if you're going to hell. I just decide how much, how much prison time you get. Right? So, so, that, so the union of reason and faith is a cornerstone of these kinds of institutions. I am the only philosophy professor at this. In, it, well, actually, that's not true. Uh, we just hired a new one. For 25 years, I was the only one. And so my job in this class, especially, is to teach you the foundation of Lyon College. I, I can't make you agree with it or disagree with it, but you need to know what it is. So if you chose this class, my introductory course in philosophy, world philosophies, is about the kind of spiritual humanism that was the foundation of um, the educational system for the best and the brightest in order to maintain a democracy. That was the idea. Um, our founders were religious heretics. They themselves, themselves were the ones that are famous, Jefferson, were deists and theists. 
they altered their religious beliefs. They still called themselves Church of England, but their, their idea of God, they switched it to fit with contemporary science because they wanted to unify reason and faith. So when the scientific paradigm changed, they changed the way they thought about God. Um, Jefferson was a Unitarian, which means he didn't think Jesus was the Messiah. So, you know, um, anyway, they were religious outliers and they were political revolutionaries, right? They declared war on their own institutions, their own country. So they were way, way out there. Um, but of course, uh, we're not like that. But we need to know that, right? That was the people that we respect questioned blind. They were not blind patriots. Not They were not at all my country right or wrong. They were my country wrong. <laughs> I'm going to start a new one. They were not blind religion, you know, traditional religion. They didn't accept that. They, you know, moved away from their extended families, started something new. So the big thing about America was you could start afresh, you can start new, you can um, create a new life for yourself. Now, for better or worse, um, but that is, that is what the country was founded on. So that we are just continuing in that tradition. This class is just the next generation of the kinds of uh, readings. So I give you, I start out with the Greeks and these are texts that were, have been read for 2,500 years, read and discussed. Um, all right, so that's just kind of a context for what we're doing. And then I will um, talk about the specifics, but I, again, there are more than this, there are a number of students missing, so I'm not quite sure what that's about, but I guess I'll, I'll have to contact them later. Um, so let's do the screen share. Um, let's see, Caitlin, do, do, were you able to watch the video, Caitlin? Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I was able to watch the video. I'm having some trouble with my computer. Um, I'm glad you can hear me, though. Yep. Okay. So, so I think, Titus, since you're the only one that hasn't listened to the video, it, it really does talk a lot about the syllabus and the papers and all that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, I guess I'll, what I'll do is I'll start very briefly reviewing it because some of you might have had questions. So I'll briefly review what I said in the video and then I'll take time for questions and then you can do your worldview, okay? So everyone's going to have a chance to present, and um, and you have a post that's due um, today by tomorrow noon, and that post will have on it your worldview that you brought with you to class, three reactions to what the other students said, or maybe what I said. I'd like to try and get you to have a conversation th with each other, right? Because you are, it's your generation that's going to pick up a position of leadership in about 20 years. And this curriculum was designed to um, educate future leaders. So what is it about the curriculum that would enable you to lead. And so it is important that you talk to each other. It's more important than, you know, having interchange with me since I'm how many, almost 50 years older than you are. 
and I sort of had my chance and I'm very disappointed in my generation, but <laughs> you have to pick up. I think we could have done a lot better for you. I uh, have a lot of regrets, but um, what's done is done and you have to pick up. So I would like you to respond to each other and you can ignore me, you know, like my, I don't, hopefully, you know, the, what I just said sounds opinionated, but it's a matter of fact that this was the curriculum that was set up and that our founders were that way. And the fact that it gets presented as a bias or a political bias, if you think of it that way, is unfortunate. And it's um, been set up to be considered an opinion and it's actually just a description of our founding. But for the most part, you know, it's you all need to work with each other and create a better future. So, so we will do that, have you react to each other. And then the post at the end of the day will have your worldview, your reactions, and then your final takeaway, because you are gonna write another worldview paper at the end, that's your final. So after every class you ask, is there anything from this class that I might put in my final that mattered the most, that I learned the most from this class? And if there, is there something in this class that I definitely won't include, because this isn't part of the way I think about the world, right? All right, so let me go over this just for a second. My office hours are from nine o'clock to midnight on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And the reason for that is that I teach uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday from nine to midnight, the students in Bangladesh, um, and so for them, I think it's a little easier. It's eight in the morning for them. It's easier to just have office hours the same hours because then they know when I'm, when I'm available. If those hours don't work for you, you can make an appointment. It's not a problem. Um, I did want you to order three books. They're not expensive. Um, I think I put these other books on the um, online bookstore and together they're all pretty cheap. As I said in the video, these are some of the best books ever written. They're the books that get passed down for thousands, thousands of years, but publishers beg you to, to buy them. They sell them at an incredibly cheap price um, in hopes that maybe you'll read them. Um, and the reason why they're so cheap, you can't make any money reading these books. <laughs> books tend to cost about as much as the amount of money you're going to make if you study that topic. <laughs> so yeah, philosophy books are super cheap, except the logic book. And that one is for future lawyers. So that one they can charge you something for. Um, all right, then I did all the all the learning outcomes, and it's just so burdensome. I spent a whole lot of time on that. Uh, and you can read it over. General skills, I'd like you to get the quality of your papers. And I went over the paper um, rubric in the video. And um, I'll, 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 I will definitely punch at it and scroll through it today during class. But in general, the longer version is on the video. Um, and then the religion and philosophy program, and especially the qualities of a liberally uh, educated mind, right? This is in our course catalog. And um, I do think it's important. And these are the character traits that are absolutely critical to maintain a free and open society because um, people have to be able to be intellectually honest. If you're gonna be able to govern, 
and be governed. If you're gonna be able to analyze political leadership, you're gonna to have to be intellectually honest and be able to identify which leaders are and which leaders are not. So that's really important. Co commitment to truth. Um, you can't just write everything off and say that something, that everything's relative. Everybody has a different opinion. Um, and I know that in this class, sometimes students tell each other, she just wants your opinion. Well, human history is determined according to people's quote unquote opinions about these topics. So actually these are the topics that cultivate wisdom, practical wisdom, and that is not trivial. <laughs> So the one thing about the pursuit of wisdom is that you have to uh, assume that there is truth, that some views are wiser and more true than others. So you have to have a commitment that there is an object there. And then being fair to opposing points of view is very important. And um, being patient with complexity and ambiguity because political issues are very complex and very ambiguous. And you do need to try to straighten out the complexity and the ambiguity. And then at a certain point, just to say, okay, this is how much I know and, and I don't know, right? There's, there are things I don't know, but I know that that person has oversimplified. You've got to be able to know when somebody has oversimplified or when somebody is um, is may uh, tended to think something is clear cut when it's really ambiguous or that something is going to be able there will be a silver bullet to solve this problem and there won't be and then the tolerance if the person you disagrees with has good reasons that's fine because as long as they're, they've based their political life, their life as a citizen on reasoning and argument and reasonable positions, you can work with them as a citizen. As long they can have religious views that are completely detached from reason, which the founding fathers allowed a lot of people into America that they didn't agree with at all. But that's fine. Religious freedom means you can say that stuff at church. But when you're in as acting as a citizen, you have to respect people as equal and free. So, um, all right. So all this other stuff is probably on all of your syllabi because we were supposed to cultivate intercultural knowledge, of course. That's big for me. Um, my strategy is to educe, okay? So the students, you already do think about these things. You just probably don't realize it or you don't, you've never had a class that actually asks you to articulate the, these kinds of ideas and then to get them straightened out in your mind and to clarify them and expand them and talk to other people and learn about the things that are in the back of your mind. Attendance is an issue. Um, each class, okay, so I talk about the procedures in the class. And that's on the video and you can look that up. I think really for everybody but Titus, this would just be um, redundant. And so I'll, I'll scroll through this and then I'll take questions. All right, did somebody have a question about the syllabus? I will say that normally, the students' questions are right on. You know, I wasn't clear about something. Um, um, I have a question. Yep. Okay, so um, Wednesday by noon, 
we're going to have both Monday and Tuesdays, um, like reflection stuff to do. Yeah. Okay. So then Friday by noon, we'll have both Wednesday and Thursdays. Yep. Okay. So for Friday, are we doing a reflection? No, because you have a paper due. So that's a good question. You can, you can do it, you know, on your Tuesday one, but you'll have plenty else to be working on. Um, and then for like the worldview essay, um, I didn't really like, uh, I know like you, you mentioned um, in the, like the opening post that you made that we were going to like talk about our worldview, um, but I didn't see a thing about like an actual essay. And I wasn't sure if there was a, like a word minimum or something that you were wanting there. Oh, I thought I did put that in as 300 words, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, you do, you do have to write something. Um, did, did I say that you had to write something? Um, not in your initial post. I think you might have mentioned it in the video, but I could. I That's could all right, Michael. So as long as you came with something and then in your post, you just write it, you know? Yeah, it's no biggie. So in general, I'm pretty free flowing on that because, because I want you to have a free mind and I want you to feel free to think. And I don't want you, oh my gosh, the teacher, you know, I'm gonna get a, a grade lower because, you know, I, the, I mean, in general, I think you probably have some teachers that are really picky about details perhaps, or, just the nature of the computer stuff, it can get really picky, right? At least I feel I don't punch the right button and I'm in trouble, but I don't want you to get into that kind of mental framework. I really want this class to be about a free mind. That's what democracy is about. And that's what our founders wanted people to feel like. They could have a free mind, but they had to, have these qualities, right? Intellectual honesty. While you're, you know, spouting your opinions, you have to be able to to support them. So that's my goal. And um, if anybody does, so I think just given that I, those are the requirements, and I've got the word counts and their minimums, and I've got the number of quotes. I think I've got the structure in there where you can sort of feel free, right? After that, they're only minimum. So if you get going on an idea, keep, keep writing. Um, that's what I'm getting at. Um, any other question? No. Why don't I do we... have one question. Sure. So on our responses, you said we're going to respond to three other people, correct? Yeah. Okay, so would that be like everybody can see your responses? We don't submit that just to you. Um, you 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 do submit it just to me. So I know that actually you have discussion, and you can do that if you want to. But the way I've structured this is that you're writing a book to yourself, right, about the class, and. I, it's, I don't know. It seems to me if you're talking to each other, it seems to me those discussion groups are when people have so many students that you can't just have this class the way that we have it, right? Does that make sense to you? I mean, we're lucky enough that the class is small enough, we can just sit and talk to each other and you don't have to have it in that additional discussion group, you can just put it on your post and you're writing, you're writing a, a book to yourself about what's on your mind. Is that fair? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Sure. Um, any other questions? The other thing about liberal arts education was that it, it was dialogue centered 
and Plato's dialogues, Plato's Apollo, um, Academy is the paradigm. And that was what I wrote my dissertation on was Plato. So, and you really need small classes and they are really labor intensive and they're expensive. So, you know, I hope, I hope you like the class and you just sort of appreciate that you're part of this longstanding tradition. And I hope I don't blow it as the teacher, you know, <laughs> uh, because it, that's my parents, we had brand X everything, but we had Cadillac college. I could go to a liberal arts school and they would shell out whatever it took. So I think a lot of your parents are in that situation and I admire them for that. And that's what I did with my kids um, because I do think it's important for you to, to talk about stuff and talk to other people. So, um, all right, because we'll start on the worldviews at this point and then I can go back to more technical stuff. Um, so I won't make Titus start because he came into the class later so he can go last. Um, Michael, do you want to start? <laughs> oh, anybody want to be bold? I can give a generalized opinion if you want. Okay, Titus, go ahead. Well, so obviously since I, I didn't have time to prepare this, my general world view is I feel like a lot of things are I guess what people are related to what they see, like they form opinions based off the things that they're seen or told. Mainly I'm referring to social media because a lot of people, especially those who are kind of going through a struggle or depressed, they're really comparing themselves to someone who seems like they're doing better in reality they don't actually know what that person has gone through or what they are currently going through to reach that point and it kind of relates to what you were saying earlier about other people hearing about like the our president being a pious person when there's obviously some negatives to him as far as other countries as well i feel like that all kind of relates to each other on both a small and large scale. So I think that once you start focusing on yourself more, then you'll realize things aren't as bad as you think. And you can obviously get a lot further because everyone has their own path. So you don't need to be focusing on others. OK, good. Um... Yeah, so the students do quite, uh, usually in this class talk a lot about social media. And um, uh, it's interesting because I remember when computers first entered the fray, right? I was pretty old, um, 40, in my 40s, I think. And at first the idea was, well, now scientists are gonna be able to connect with each other and we'll have, this boom in scientific research. Also, I, I was, um, I don't know if you know Greta Thunberg, but when she found out about climate change, she got really depressed. She was in high school and then she had this uh, Fridays for the Future. Well, the thing is, I found about climate change in 1969 and I got really depressed. And I had to decide, you know, how am I going to live? Uh, the world really needs to go one direction. And I, for the next 50 years, I watched it go the other direction. Um, but I thought when the computers came in, I thought, oh, well, now the climate change scientists will really be able to set up good models and look at the synchronistic effects and we can really get a handle on this, right? And of course, <laughs> that is not what happened. <laughs> Uh, so I remember exactly when this transition went from 
the most of the people who were using computers were highly educated, sophisticated, and doing it for their uh, professional enhancement. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> Facebook, you know, and it went south. And then I remember at first it was pretty positive. And then it started uh, going, uh, really going dark, right? So um, then the question is whether people can self-correct, right? So I think that your generation has had it long enough so that I think you're capable of thinking critically about all this stuff, right? Does that make sense, Titus? And that that you can self-correct. I mean, just for example, in, your, in the discussion in this class, you're gonna be able to give each other examples and you know, but I'm sure you do that quite a bit at this point. Um, and then my students in, Bank, in Southeast Asia, they have the same experience, right? A lot of their friends, their less educated friends uh, really are suckers for social media, for conspiracy theories and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> so it is amazing, right? They say exactly the same things that, that Lion students say. And, and I'm in the fortunate position of being the teacher of the students who really are destined to be the critical thinkers. If they don't become the critical thinkers, we have no leadership, right? Does that everybody understand that? Um, you do have a responsibility. Going to college gives you social responsibility. It gives you opportunity, but it also gives you responsibility. Um, and the other thing I always say is that, you know, you, people make themselves into a brand, right, Titus? You, you create not only do you create a brand of this or that, you are the brand, right? And so I'm going to be the little whatever brand. I don't know. Um, stereotype sorority girl, MRS degree in college brand, right? And I'm going to sort of market myself and get a lot of whatever likes or friends or whatever. I don't do Facebook, but um, but okay, before that, it was that politics is just a brand, which really annoys me because it isn't about branding. It's about making decisions that affect people a lot, right? And we've made it into this brand. And that I think is really, really detrimental to the collective well being, but making yourself into a brand. And knowing that you aren't your brand, right? There's is uh, is really psychologically unhealthy, right? You don't have integrity. Um, so there's one thing to just put on a happy face in the morning. You know, you can't always. You have to go out and put on the veneer of civilization, but to actually do it on Facebook 24/7 is super psychologically unhealthy because you can't have integrity, right? So, yeah, so I get that, Titus. Everybody else, anybody else want to comment? Of course, I'm talking way too much. I could um, comment. Go, go ahead. Um, I don't know if this is like back, backing off fam or not, but I remember watching in your video about worldview and about how yours has kind of changed since you've been in Minnesota, right? Is that right, Minnesota? Right. And so I feel like me as a, man, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Go I ahead. feel like as a person, I've been kind of like had a sheltered worldview. Whereas now that like with social media and now being in college, I'm thinking for myself and also like seeing things that I've never seen before that have like kind of transpired my perception of how I'm living and my worldview. And that's just kind of how social media and traveling and going to college. Okay, good. Um, so do you want to, do you want to take the next turn? 
Uh, is it Mariana? Mary Hannah. Yes. Mary Hannah. Okay. Do you want to go next? Um, okay. I was kind of confused on what we were actually supposed to be doing. Um, so I had a few things written down. I didn't know if you wanted us to define like worldview or give our worldview. I was confused on that topic. Well, I mean, my point is that I want you to figure out in your mind what matters to you. And so, you know, there isn't a right or wrong answer. And in a sense, it tells you something about you, how you interpret the question, right? And so I just gave you completely free reign to interpret the question. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Just for Tasha. starters. Yeah, I, you know, you've been so habituated. What do you want? I wasn't sure you want, you know, I, and I think most teachers would probably have an answer to that. <laughs> but uh, I actually want you to try to feel free and less confined. So go ahead. Um, well, for me, like, I think that I know he talked a lot about social media, and that is a lot to me. But I think a lot of it is about, to me, was how I was raised. And that's always like affected my worldview. And I've always been a religion, like mixed how you were talking about religion and like church and state type situation. And that's just kind of how I've always viewed the world. Okay. And then I did talk in the video that we will talk about the different religions. And we'll talk about the similarities because it's easy to know the differences. Okay. Just again, um, this kind of education is complexity and ambiguity, right? Just always making it more complex. And that's, that's the point. Um, anybody want to go next? I'll go. Okay. So um, my interpretation of worldview, I'll, I feel like it just means basically your like experience of how you were raised, like the people you grew up around, like your connections, you know, um, cause like piggybacking off of Mary Hannah, when I was younger, I was very sheltered. My parents really didn't let me do much, but now that I'm on my own and in college, I'm seeing more of the world and I'm um, able to like interpret myself to myself what the world means, so. I think the developmental psychologists know that you're at that point in life where you can uh, re-examine stuff. It doesn't mean you have to rebel against it. It just means you can't, you can no longer say it's because my mother told me, right? That's not the reason anymore, right? Why do you eat vegetables? Because my mother told me, no, actually my mother was right. It's because they're good for me. That's why, you know. Right? Does that make sense? It's it's not based on rebelling or not rebelling. It's changing the foundation upon which you live your life, right? From habit and custom and imitation to reason. Okay. Um, anybody else want to follow up on that? Uh, I'll say um, a I can, bit. Oh, you can go. Yeah, you got it. You got it. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, because mine kind of built off of what you just said. Like, I, like most of my opinions and thoughts were like based off what my parents had told me before, and like once I got to college, I kind of realized that like not that I I still agree with them, but like I can see like the reasons why, and I feel like generationally like our generation is less like harsh. I feel like we're more open-minded. And so like you said, like changing the basis is how like we move on after like the development and whatnot. Well, what else about your generation? Do you think you are less racist? Yeah, I mean- I feel is, like, yeah. yeah. I don't, I feel like most of our, like not all, obviously there's 
it's still kind of the same in some ways because some people don't ever get out of their home to like learn new things like we get the experience to go to college and whatnot but I feel like like overall with college students our generation is more accepting overall um, do you think go ahead go ahead I'm sorry. um I don't I wouldn't necessarily say that we're less racist uh I would say that we're like as a whole we're we're becoming more aware of like actively we're becoming more aware of racism but not necessarily that we're seeing a decline um just that like I feel like like I, I feel like a lot of students like they go to the line and like maybe like one of the things I talked about was like um like the kind of not silent but kind of like the silent prejudices that like just growing up in the south and like specifically in like rural Arkansas that like I didn't really realize until I went to Lyon and so I feel like it's more like people are becoming more aware and I think that eventually that could lead to less racism but I don't know like that I would say that it's that, that we're actually there. Go ahead. Uh, I, I Kia, you can respond. Oh, um, just to piggyback off of Michael, I do agree with us being more like open to things, but as far as racism, I don't see it going down, but that's just because me being from an African-American standpoint, but as far as like our generation being more open-minded and being aware of things, I do agree with what Michael was saying. Okay. What about sexism? I mean, it's obvious that colleges don't discriminate, right? Based on race or sex or sexual orientation or religious affiliation or any of that, right? So we've set things up, but what about you? <laughs> Has it had any effect or what do you think guys? Folks, anybody have an opinion? Do you think you all are less sexist? Um, and then that's different. Less sexist is different than actually sexist, right? I don't know. Nobody's talking. Okay, Trelon, were you gonna take your turn here? Yeah. Um... So I jotted a couple of stuff down and I said, my definition of worldview is basically like how we experience the world in our own way. Everybody kind of goes through different experiences and interactions in their own, uh, their own life pretty much. So nobody really, no, nobody in the world is the same. Nobody will ever go through the same experiences and all the things and emotions that they go through. Um, I believe that people have a different right or wrong and I think, you know, my right or wrong may be different from your right or wrong, but then again, we still have the same type of, you know, right or wrong stances. Um, I definitely, I definitely do think that the mentors that we have definitely make a huge impact on us, um, giving us, you know, different like information on different types of like stances on how we should view one thing or how we should view another thing. Um, I wrote down that like some, 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 People teach through positivity and some teach through negativity negativity. And I don't really think it's is is I think it's very hard to be, you know, uh, I would say like agreeing with a negative uh communication with a person because nobody really wants to, you know, listen to somebody who gives off a negative uh kind of uh approach, if you feel what I'm saying. Um I find that I said I find the best way to communicate with me is through like a calm interaction. Cause I, it's, it's hard for like me to understand somebody's point of view by being like yelled at and, and cussed at. Cause if I'm talking to you as like, you know, how we're just talking right now and, and then somebody's coming at me with like a uh, kind of like negative tone, then I kind of just don't want to listen anymore. Um, and then the last thing I kind of wrote was, uh, I believe that my version of like, uh, my version of like discipline is different from others because I don't I don't believe like a harsh discipline is the is never like the way to go. I I feel like everybody should be talked through through like 
a normal communication and heard out from what they see or what they go through. Cause you never really know what somebody's really going through. Um, it's always different and you'll never really like kind of understand somebody's emotions, what they're going through. Okay. I just had a student this morning from Bangladesh. She wants to write a research paper on why you shouldn't beat your children <laughs> because it's such a common practice, right? And that happens, it happens here, right? Um, people in, unfortunately, religious schools, you know, if they're private schools, they tend to be given more leeway to be more harsh. So, um, so Zach, let's see, how about you? Uh, so I guess, like, the way I did the world, do you, can you hear me okay? It's okay, it's not great, but it's okay. 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 Uh, so I guess the way that I did the worldview was kind of like more from like, I guess my values and how I view the world. So like I said, like with hard work, like you can achieve like anything that you desire. Like if you treat people well, most of the time, like people will treat you well back. Uh, I also said that like, especially being like uh, here for four years at Lion, that like, it's good that like, that I've been surrounded by people who have had different viewpoints in mind. So I think it's kept me open-minded. And then, um, then like how I view the world in general, like I just, I view it optimistically, like, I can pretty much see the good in almost anything. Okay, so you're a senior, Zach? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Um, how many of you are seniors? One, two. Th oh, three. Wow. That's that's a lot. You're just getting this off the checklist list. <laughs> Finish up. All right. Um, why don't the seniors say? Uh, what is it that you think you really learned by coming to Lyon and getting exposed? Was there something surprising about being put into that environment? Something that happened to you that you didn't expect um, in terms of your growth? Um, I guess coming from, I came from a small high school. It was all black, so I never really had much experience or not really open mindedness as far as other people's opinions and stuff. But I guess the main thing I learned coming here is that it really, all the things people say, it really isn't as bad as they make it out to be. It's always exaggerated. And I'm glad to have learned that by coming here because now I'm, I've become far more accepting because I'm now more knowledgeable. What were the bad things they said? <laughs> it was just bad. It was just bad thing. Not bad things. I guess just stereotypical things, more or less. Those dang liberals are gonna brainwash you or something? <laughs> no, <laughs> they wanted me to go to. Let's see an HBCU like Southern or okay. Graham. Basically when I told them I was coming to Lyon, they wanted me to like go to a bigger college so I could play football and stuff. They weren't as interested in academics and stuff like that. But I'm glad I came here. Good, that's good. Do you think, um, you know, again, the old, the old um, model is the scholar athlete, right? that you're an amateur athlete, but um, it's a sound mind in a sound body. So being physically fit is necessary for staying mentally alert and all that stuff. I mean, I wrote a paper on the Olympics, right? Um, do you think that Lion follows that at least a lot better than a lot of other schools? I say definitely better than the schools 
I'm around for the most part. I know that the U of M, you know, Minnesota, their basketball team this one year, it was in the paper, only 17% of them actually got degrees. And so I just feel like the school just took advantage of them, right? Used their talent to sell tickets and then threw them out, you know, and they don't have a future. I, I think that's really abusive, right? I don't, I think that's offensive. Does that make sense? Um, so I don't think Lion does that. Does that, is that seem fair to the rest of you who are athletes? I mean, Lion isn't really profitable off of their athletics. So like you, you like at no point would we really have that relationship between student athletes and actually making money. So like that's, you know, like in Lion, that's not really like an option, if that makes sense. I also, in my classes, I never have the athletes, you know, and the good students. It's not like that at all. It's never been like that. So, um, so I, it seems to me it works pretty well, but I'm not sure, you know, I just have my own experience. Um, all right, has anybody? Okay, so the next thing I want to ask you, because um, I think a lot of you think in terms of generation, right? Um, I didn't so much, but again, I'm a philosopher and whatever. Um, do you think your generation, okay, the question is, are they less racist, less sexist? Um, what about environmental issues? Because you are going to, it's going to radically change your life, the weather. Uh, how many of you actually think that's true? It's statistically, it, it's just uh, really, really bad. By the time you're my age, I have no idea, right? What's gonna be the case. So why do you think so many people in your generation are not aware of it? Um, well, I think, I know at one point President Trump took us out of the, the Paris Agreement, I think it was. Um, so I think like politically, you could see maybe a, a shift there um, to where um, people of, especially people who come from Republican households maybe don't take it quite as seriously because of um, how politics affects us as people. Okay, I mean then, there's the economics behind the politics, right? So who's paying for the political campaigns? Um, I do think you should know that, right? But I'm not gonna bring it up. It's just, all I have to say is that the climate will change and it will affect your life, right? And so um, you can go find out some of the stuff behind it, the history, um, but that's why in a liberal arts school, you have to take history courses and philosophy courses and things like that, because um, you should be able to see yourself stepping into the, the river of history, right? What about, um, okay, I'm going to ask each of you, what did you gain from the Black Lives Matter movement a year ago. Okay, a year ago, the demonstrations were on one of my students missed class. Um, so one thing I will say, just to get it started, is that the middle class has been shrinking and uh, in a dysfunctional society, the rich keep getting richer, the middle class shrinks and then they pit the lower middle class against the underclass. They sort of sick them on each other. And so people get preoccupied with that and they don't notice you know, that the rich are sort of walking away with everything. So I, at least I want you to know that I, I know that it's a very difficult situation, but it's because we don't put resources into preventing 
problems from happening. And um, there isn't enough interest in the top of setting up programs, institutionalizing some way of preventing people getting in these kinds of situations where they have to make these really terrible decisions. Does that make sense? Just for starters, as a, as a, a way to <laughs> realize it's complex, it's not. I also read a book I think is really important called The Color of Law. And it's about the discrimination against African-Americans in terms of housing ever since World War I. So that uh, they cannot get by a house with a mortgage that increases in value. I don't, do you all understand all that? That house equity, you buy your house, and you pay part of your monthly payment is to the bank that gave you the loan. And the other part is on the principal of your house. And so over time, you're, you're actually making money. It's your money. And um, the houses in general go up in value. So you literally increase your wealth without having paid for it. So most middle-class people a big chunk of their family wealth is uh, house equity, equity in your house. My family's wealth is house equity. I, my kids went to college because of equity on a house, okay? And so when I read that book that African-Americans have never had a chance to buy houses with this kind of mortgage, amortized mortgages in neighborhoods where the value of the house went up. And, you know, and that's why they have like 10% of the wealth. It's not because they don't work. It's because, and that's what I call systemic racism, right? It's institutionalized, it's systemic, and it's really hard to break the chain. Um, does, that, does that make sense to the rest of you? Have you ever asked your family how much of your family wealth is, is in home equity? I think a lot of my students, it really isn't the case because equity in small towns in Arkansas, <laughs> you know, your houses don't have that much equity. But you do need to understand that in the, in the country in general, in, in the cities, if you have a house in a city and you got a house in a reasonable middle-class neighborhood, even lower middle-class neighborhood, and you got that kind of a loan, your family wealth would have gone up over the last 50 years, big time. Um, and then most housing projects got funded by the government have been for white people, <laughs> as a matter of fact, since World War I. Um, there's just, I don't know, I just recommend that book because it just gives you this whole story of how systemic it is. And then you would understand in general how racism is systemic. Then you can, then you can separate it from emotions and stories, you know. Oh, it's called The Color of Race. Um, and it was written as kind of a letter to the Supreme Court justices because they took away a whole lot of affirmative action programs because they said, racism is not a problem anymore. And black people live where they live because they like living with other black people. Really, <laughs> that's, that's our Supreme Court. And so he, you know, or they just said, it's not the government's fault. And so he wrote the book just to refute the Supreme Court's decision to say, these decisions were made by the government and they're the document, he just documented it. Um, so I, again, you can be a Republican or Democrat or anything, that's, this should just be reasonable. This is, I'm just giving arguments about political things based on reason, um, but it has to be the big picture, right? You have to see things in a historical perspective. You have to see uh, your family's wealth is not your salary, primarily. Another way people get really rich 
is if they put money in stocks, right? Okay, it's again, it's not your salary. Um, and then the, the taxes on the, the benefits you get from your stocks is half as high as the taxes on a person who goes to work every day, okay? <laughs> like the receptionist goes to work, she pays 28% in taxes. The rich guy puts money in, you know, Amazon stock, makes a pile of money and pays 15%. <laughs> and they didn't even work to get that money. That's, I don't know, how many of you think that ain't fair? I mean, this, so the, there's a myth that if you work hard, you'll get the, you know, the fruit of your labor, that your wealth will reflect your amount of work. That just is not true, I'm sorry. You know, I wish it were true, maybe once it was true, but I, I, you know, I can benefit from this stuff. I have investments, I don't have a lot, but I have enough to know that the people who don't have them fall that much farther behind. That's what I know. Um, so anyway, um, what was your takeaway? And we're going to read uh, Martin Luther King. We're gonna work on this by the end of the week. What was your takeaway though on Black Lives Matter? Did you have a, something that lessons learned some way moving forward? You think the country should change or your generation? should do something about this. Um, Michael, you can start. Um, I don't, like I did a lot, like during that time I did a lot of like, um, like personal research, I guess. Um, so like it, it kind of forced me to like learn more, I don't know. Um, and then I also feel like a lot of white people are so ignorant. I feel like I learned a lot of white people are so ignorant. Um, but I don't, I don't know. Um, I didn't, like I said, I didn't follow the, the movement itself too closely. I really kind of used it as a time for like, um, um, like personal education, I guess. Well, I will say that um, white people in places like Batesville, the rural, especially South, where they don't have houses that accumulate equity would have a lot less understanding of, of what's really going on because such a high percentage of black and brown people live in cities and it is make a big difference that they can't get the right kind of housing. Does that, does everybody understand that? That um, you really have to think outside of your own box in order to understand uh, probably 90% of the difference in wealth is because of stuff like that. And, and so it's understandable that the people don't understand, but they really need to understand that's, does that make sense, Michael? Um, so again, we're hoping a liberally educated person will be able to go out there and change the conversation, right? Um, so Akia, do you have an opinion about BLM? Um, I, like Michael, I really wasn't following the movement too closely like that, but um, I just feel like because of that movement, everybody should become more aware of what's going on in the world. And like, yeah, that's really what all I took away from the movement, so. Okay, um, Caitlin? Um, I don't really like, like, I learned, like, we need to be more aware, obviously. I feel like that's one of the biggest things. But I also just, like, learned that people, like, if you disagree with them, like, I don't know. I don't even like the subject because I feel like it's just really touchy and 
I just feel like people are not always understanding. Like, even if you don't agree with the whole topic, if you just agree with, like, one thing, then they just come after you for everything, even though that's not really what you're trying to get across to them. Yeah, okay. As long as you understand liberal arts education is exactly about not doing that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. But it's not like, it's just like from what I've like seen from like other, not just at line home or like anywhere else, just. Right. Yeah. Is it, is it, you know, the point is that the mission of Lyon College is a very important mission. And I, you know, I hope I can live up to it, really. Uh, it's a lot bigger than me. Um, Mar Mar Mary Hannah? Mary Hannah, yes, ma'am. Mary Hannah, what, what did you take away? Um, I come from a small town, and it's, it's a nice town. So, like, uh, the Black people, like, just African Americans that were in my hometown, um, you just didn't see a lot of, I didn't see, it wasn't as in your face as um, how Black people and African Americans and just minorities were treated um, until, like, I remember exactly where I was when you start seeing videos all over social media, and that kind of goes back to my perception of worldview because, and how social media affects it. Like, I didn't understand, um, I wasn't really aware of what was going on until it was in my face. Um, so that's just kind of how I was affected by it. It made me a lot more aware. I started to think twice before I spoke about anything. Um, I didn't mean to. I judged people that I shouldn't have. Like I caught myself doing a lot of things that I knew was wrong. Um, and the Black Lives Movement made me aware of that, that I wouldn't have seen before or noticed in other people. So that's basically how, I, how that affected me. Okay. Um, Titus. Mm, that's overall, it makes people, well, my take is that it makes people truly aware, like there's one thing to hear about all of this stuff in class or read it in the history books, but to actually look and see stuff happening before your eyes, it just brings a whole new perspective of awareness. And I guess it gives you more motivation to take action and be part of the solution instead of just hanging back and kind of brushing it aside. And that was kind of what, well, the gist of what I took from it. Okay, well, you know, Lion College has an annual thing on Martin Luther King Day, but I mean, we could do more if students want to become more active. Um, Trelon, is is that the right way to pronounce it? Or it's, uh, it's, it's Traylon. Traylon, okay. So um, basically how I see it coming from an, from an African-American standpoint, the fact that we have to say like Black Lives Matter is a decline to me. Um, I feel like because of all that's been happening and what's been going on, the fact that we have to say Black Lives Matter is a decline to me. So it's kind of like making me feel as if nothing's really happening, but it's it's getting worse if if that seems like it's right. So that's really how I feel. Okay, what about you, Zach? Yeah, I mean, it definitely made me more aware of like stuff that's been going on that I may have not have seen before and like make me more like I don't know like uh, I'm still not like too educated on it so like uh, I'm not sure okay um so what I'll so here's some of the materials that we went over and this is one of the things that um I don't necessarily agree or disagree with this stuff, but maybe Black Lives Matter, you could say on this issue, you just were disinterested, right? You just were drifting, you just had other things. And maybe it's made you more aware, right? 
And so the second step is to just say, you know, the status quo was fine, right? I'm going to do it the way my parents did it or why we don't really have to change or whatever. But then the third step would be, okay, I think maybe I need to start re-examining this, right? I need to find out what, um, what I've been, you know, I was raised to ignore it or something, right? Or not to take it seriously. So maybe you can, you know, think that you've moved into a, a more critical phase, right? Where you want to activate your mind on this. And definitely you haven't figured out a conclusion yet. So I, I, I hesitate on that achieved identity thing because my God, I'm still working out <laughs> my identity. So I don't think you have to think there's a final point there, but if it could have raised your awareness, um, my father marched in Selma, Alabama when I was in fifth grade and I still remember that. So, so these issues were pretty, you know, boots on the ground for me growing up and people would call him on the phone and say racist things to him and all that stuff. Um, so I'm pretty aware of that. Um, let me just um, save the assignment for next time. We didn't get to these things. Uh, that's probably because I talk too much, but um, what I have is, so all this stuff, you can disregard a lot of those number ones and all that, that was a Schoology. So what I'm doing, and, and the one annoying thing about it is you have to scroll quite a bit, but this is the class I taught last summer. And I think that I could save a lot of time punching buttons and I could have a lot more time for uh, thinking and talking to you and reading your papers if, you, if we just do it this way. So for next time, this is the assignment for tomorrow. I'm going to give a PowerPoint. Um, and then the main thing, this is just a notes. This is an outline. But there's a, there's a Platonic dialogue, the text here. So I would like you to read a Platonic di dialogue. All right. This is Socrates, um, and I, I was supposed to get to this before, but that's the main text. And then I have news articles corresponding to analogies between the characters in the text and um, things that happen today. Um, God is, so the character in the text is a religious leader, and he's, this is a true story, and he's taking his father to court for murder and Socrates is saying are you sure <laughs> and he's saying yeah I know what God wants God you know God wants this this is what God wants so um so the the main point I want to make is you're going to probably feel lost just stepping right into this stuff but in general it's a person who is a religious leader who thinks he knows, right? What God wants to the point that he's gonna take his dad to court for murder in a rather questionable case. It wasn't cut and dried. And Socrates is asking him, well, are you sure? Well, you know, tell me what it is to be righteous or pious or holy, okay? So um, when I was, you know, younger, it didn't, I was pretty young when I, when I became aware of the fact that religious leaders disagreed, right? Because my dad was a religious leader, he was a preacher, and he was working for the civil rights movement, then there was other preachers that were totally against it. And then there was, you know, that there, there were religious leaders disagreed. And I just knew that from the age 10, <laughs> which is probably a little young. Uh, but anyway, so religious leaders do disagree. And so probably before you read it, you should ask yourself, well, what do I look for in a religious leader, right? What is holiness? And what do I look for in a person that I would call particularly 
religious or holy or pious or whatever the word is, what, what characteristics do they have? And then how does politics corrupt religion? Why is it that our founders did not want politicians to talk about God, right? And did not want that. Why do they want to separate those? Um, how is it that religion can corrupt politics and politics can corrupt religion, right? So anyway, the newspaper articles are all very, um, they're during the Bush era because I thought that students will be emotionally somewhat disconnected when uh, later on when I teach the material. Um, and so I thought I could use Bush as an example. I don't use Trump stuff as an example because people are too attached. It's too recent. Um, but I think you can see a little clearer if you give it a little distance. Does that seem fair? Because the patterns don't go away. <laughs> anyway, when you read it, you might feel lost. Don't worry, just pick something and we'll get started on the conversation. And, um, I'll give you actually, I'll, when my nine to 12 class ends, I'll make a video where I explain it a little better, right? And then we'll go at it at 6.15. If it turns out that the students are engaged and you would like to spend a little more time and we can, we can start at 5.45 and maybe Michael won't be back from work yet or whatever, but we can start a little earlier if you'd like to. It's just a conversation, you know? And it, it doesn't have to, you know, it's, I don't want you to think of it as, oh God, more class, are you kidding? But it's just a conversation, okay? All right, so good luck and relax and just try to think, think outside of the box and I'll throw you something. <laughs> I'll throw you something outside of any old box every time and you'll have to think about it, okay? So in philosophy, it's box. I don't see a box. What's a box? <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Hey, Dr. Bay. Hi. Um, I was just gonna say, and I'll, I'll send this to you in, in an email too, um, because I know it'll be easier for both of us. Um, but the, on the 23rd of July uh, is my last, it's my last day up here. Um, and then I'll be making the trek back to Arkansas. Um, and so I, um, one second. I had a note. Okay, you know what, I don't know where it went. That's familiar. I mean, I <laughs> I can identify with that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just have to, you know, talk to you later then. Um, I don't know. Is it just a request to miss class or? Oh, yes. Yes. That's what it was going to, yes. Is that I won't be, because I'll be on the way back. 